Uh, what I'm going to do is, is a little bit of introductory material uh, and, uh, and having to do with surface spectroscopy uh, and uh, you know, how one can use theory to understand these things in modeling. And, uh, and then we're going to go on and do some specific examples uh, as well as some, some very modern stuff that has to do with, with uh, you know, recent uh, types of measurements and, and theory that can be applied to this topic of plasma enhanced uh, spectroscopy. Let's try this. Aha! And uh, this is work that I do in collaboration with a number of uh, fantastic experimental groups, and, and some of the figures are listed over here. But today, it's going to be primarily Rick Van Dyne, who is one of my famous colleagues and was, uh, you know, uh, Amanda, <laughs> her research supervisor, and th so forth. Uh, and uh, there's just lots of things that keep coming out of, out of collaborations with him that you'll see. Uh, and, uh, you know, in my group, many, many excellent uh, people uh, who have contributed to understanding kind of the theory parts of these things, and so you'll see uh, them uh, mentioned as we go along. And so I'm going to initially talk about electromagnetic effects in surface enhanced environment spectroscopy, then we'll talk about single molecule plasma enhanced electron transfer, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the uh, something called femtosecond stimulated Raman scattering, and we'll make it uh, surface enhanced. Uh, the the um, so so this is a historical slide. Uh, you know uh, you know way back in the middle 1970s. Uh, well, several groups were invol involved in the discovery of SIRS, but the one the paper I always like to quote quote is this one right here by Jean Marin Van Dyne. Uh, and you know what they did way back then was to uh, put pyridine, this molecule right here, onto uh, 1970s versions of, of silver nanoparticles and then to measure the Raman spectrum. And this is the Raman spectrum they got. Uh, and uh, this is the Raman spectrum of 2.5 molar pyridine in solution. Uh, and they look pretty similar. Okay, but when you figure out the number of molecules being uh, irradiated for a monolayer concentration here, compared to what you get in a more of a bulk measurement, uh, there's like a million times difference. And so since the signal to noise is about the same, it says that there's an enhancement factor of 10 to the sixth that applies to that. Okay, so that was a big deal discovery back then. And, and uh, even though in some respects, the correct explanation and everything was written down within a couple of years of, of this paper, uh, the, the, uh, there was immense confusion there were many explanations, okay? There were lots of ideas. Many of those ideas persist to this day, okay? Uh, and uh, it's too complicated to get involved in, but, but I'll try to tell you sort of the, the main issues. So it turns out that this led to an appreciation of, of the importance of electromagnetic uh, enhancement factors in uh, when you excite plasmons in metal particles, okay? And uh, for surface enhanced Raman, uh, it turns out that, so you're inducing a dipole in the metal particle and then there's big fields associated, electric fields associated with that induced dipole, and that leads then to uh, this famous enhancement factor, where it's the, the field around the particle surface uh, uh, squared at the incident wavelength times that at the Stokes shifted wavelength. That's the enhancement factor, or roughly e to the fourth. And if you average over the particle surface, that's the number that should have been 10 to the sixth. Uh, back in the 1970s. Nowadays, we know that the peak enhancement factor could, can go as high as 10 to the 12th. Okay, and so that's really an amazing result. Okay, and, and uh, uh, you know, I won't talk about these other ones, but basically anything that's a spectroscopic property can be electromagnetically enhanced. And some issues that are not spectros don't involve light that it can also be enhanced. Uh, the, the, uh, and so, you know, there have been various people who try to estimate these enhancements. We did a paper back in the 80s, but many others did this too, where you tried to calculate the enhancement factors. Actually, this is E squared, not E to the fourth. Okay, and we did it for prolate silver steroids, and we found that if you have an aspect ratio of 4 to 1, you could get values of 500 or so for this enhancement factor. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, if, if you think of e, e to the fourth as being 10 to the sixth, then E squared would be sort of like at 10 to the 10 cubed, and so this number uh, uh, suggested that the, indeed these electromagnetic enhancement factors were the dominant player in what was going on. Uh, and Van Dyne did an experiment only published in 2005 that in which he basically did uh, Raman excitation profiles. Uh, this was uh, for these molecules of benzene thiol that was uh, adsorbed onto these silver particles. Uh, and it turns out, if you think of, if you think of SIRS as being e to the fourth and extinction as being sort of like e squared, then uh, you'd think that the extinction spectrum, which is a blue curve, should be you know, broader than the uh, SIRS 
uh, excitation profile, and indeed that's exactly what happens. Okay, and uh, and also uh, because of the Stokes shift, you'd think that this might have its peak shifted over a little bit compared to this one, uh, and indeed by about half the vibrational frequency, and indeed that's the shift between one and the other that you see in the in this figure. So everything is consistent. I mean, it really works. So uh, once we you know, realize, hey, you can understand a lot of what's going on in SIRS, not everything, in terms of this electromagnetic enhancement factor, uh, the, you know, that gave us confidence, well, we should just go off and calculate these E squareds and maximum e, e to the fourth values for everything that we could think of and see what comes out the best. Okay, so here we did it for a bunch of silver particles that have plasma and maxima near 700 nanometers, uh, and we found that the best we could find were things like rods and triangular prisms, anything with a high aspect ratio basically is about the same and uh, the and here you can easily get average e to the force of 10 to the 6 by just doing solving Maxwell's equations and plugging in the experimental dielectric functions and calculating this uh, e to the fourth value for the fields around the particle surfaces okay uh, and so that was pretty good uh, but uh, it turns out we found is though that you can also if you take these two the, this rod and you put two of them together with a small gap like a two nanometer gap you get an e to the fourth which average which is which is 10 to the eighth or nearly 10 to the eighth and so that says then that uh, actually what you really want to focus in on SIRS is is these uh, you know small gaps the electromagnetic hotspots because that can completely dominate uh, the this uh, you know Raman intensity so small volumes can really uh, dominate the, the Raman intensity. And not only that, when you look at this e to the fourth as a function of the gap size, it just gets bigger and bigger as you go to smaller and smaller gaps. Or if you do a log-log plot, you discover that more or less it's linear and you get a one over gap squared dependence of e to the fourth. So that's pretty amazing. Okay, and it says, oh, you want to make that gap go as small as you possibly can make it. Okay, uh, but it turns out that there are limits on that and, and in the last few years we, we've realized and many other groups have done this too, that uh, if you get down to gaps that are where electrons can start tunneling back and forth between the particles, uh, then that does two things. One, it changes the plasmon resonances in a dramatic way uh, to a different wavelength, which experimentalists don't like. Okay, and uh, the other one is that that uh, it leads to smaller enhancements. And so, uh, so it turns out, from a practical point of view, what you really want to do is is to have an, uh, a gap size that's on the order of a nanometer or so. Okay. Well, it turns out the Van Dyne group discovered that they had particles that were just lying around in the lab that sort of do that. Okay, so these is 80 nanometer gold particles that can make form dimers and trimers and other aggregates. And it turns out that they're made in such a way that they have roughly a one nanometer gap uh, for them. Molecules are sitting on the surfaces and then there's a silica shell that's put around them that is uh, just for protection. Uh, and it turns out you get an average, average enhancement factors that are in the 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th uh, region for this particular uh, choice. So that was, that's pretty exciting. Uh, and then uh, the, the, uh, uh, what was discovered in those experiments is that if you, if you look at the Rayleigh scattering experiment, say of a trimer like this, uh, you get not like one plasmon peak in these results, but rather you get uh, multiple peaks. Okay, so this is the measured spectrum. We did calculations of the Rayleigh scattering spectrum and you get results that are similar. Uh, and so, you know, but, but no surprise here. These are just multipole resonances, okay? Uh, you can have dipole, quadrupole, higher multipoles, okay? And the, the uh, uh, and it turns out that, you know, the quadrupoles are dark when, when it comes to something like really scattering. And so that's, so the minimum here is actually a resonance, okay? Uh, and, uh, the, and so, you know, when you look at something like e to the fourth, which we've calculated here, it's pretty much flat over the region where all these resonances are located. And that's telling you then the e to the fourth doesn't know about all the interferences that lead to these, uh, you know, the, to the, all the structure in the Rayleigh scattering spectrum. Uh, and so this is just a theory way of showing that result. So here, uh, this is a bright uh, resonance, so the, the local field extends out to infinity, whereas this is a dark resonance, uh, and uh, the, the and so therefore it doesn't go to infinity, at least the intensity is lower. But on the other hand, if you look at the uh, just what the fields are like close to the particles, so here's the same particles, but now we blow up the region around this crack between the particles, and it turns out that you get these really high uh, contours here on the order of nearly 10 to the 12th for the bright resonance, but this is the dark resonance 
an incident does the same thing. So the near field behavior can be really quite different than the far field behavior. And Van Dyne's group did uh, measurements that, that, uh, for, such as this, this, this blue curve is the Raman excitation profile, the red curve is the Rayleigh scattering spectra. Uh, this is a, this, there's a, there's a, you know, a peak here, a peak here. There's actually a peak over here in the near infrared. Uh, and so this region right here is where there's a dark resonance and uh, what the Van Dyne group found was the, that the uh, excitation spectrum was actually pretty high in this region and these are calculations of the same quantities and <coughs> deed it all sort of matches. So that works. Uh, so, so now what I'd like to do is to tell you about something fairly recent that's been done in the Van Dyne group where uh, the idea was to use, actually use these same dimer structures uh, and now try to, try to do something where we induce chemistry okay, uh, of some sort or another with, with light. Okay, and so in this case, the molecule that we're looking at is this bi bispyroethylene molecule, BPE, and, and the molecules are actually located everywhere on the particle surfaces, but a few of them are located in this one nanometer gap between the particles Okay, so that's what we're going to focus in on. Okay, and uh, the and in this case, we're going to do an experiment, or Van Dyne's group is going to do an experiment. Okay, in which the you're irradiating this system uh, with actually two. Uh, different wavelengths at the same time, so a two-color experiment. One of them is going to be at 785, which is going to be used for the Raman uh, uh, measurement and involves pretty low uh, intensities of 0.34 microwatts. On the other hand, they're going to also irradiate occasionally at 532 with 112 microwatts, so this is the one that's going to drive some sort of, a, of, of electron transfer process. Okay, so, uh, so here's the experiment. You're always irradiating with 785. Occasionally you have 532 on for like 10 seconds second intervals, and then it turns out after you turn the 532 off, then you, then you do the Raman measurement, okay, uh, and so in this case, then the time scale, the time resolution experiment is on the order of seconds, okay, you turn one light, you turn, turn the, five, the 532 off, and then, then you come back and, and turn the, the, uh, the Raman measurement on, okay, and we're going to see what that leads to. So, uh, so these are the spectra, uh, so this is one spectrum that's obtained of, of this B BPE molecule, okay, and I'll show you in a second that this indeed is BPE. This is frame zero, okay, same as down here. Okay, but then what you do is every every few seconds you measure a new spectrum, okay, and, and so this is a waterfall plot showing spectra as a function of, of uh, frame, okay, and uh, so this peak, these peaks right here are the same as these peaks over here, okay, so most of the time you're looking at BPE, although notice the intensity of the BPE uh, is, is going down as you do this measurement. Uh, and then, uh, but in addition, every once in a while, you see a little tiny little blip here. And if you subtract off the BPE part of it, you can blow up these blips and make them look a little bit bigger. So every once in a while, there's a frame in which the spectrum, uh, this is frame 95, that's BPE. Frame 96, oh, something else is present. Frame 125, something else is present. Okay, and it's like, what's going on? Okay, so that's the idea. So here we did calculations. Uh, this is, now you can use electronic structure methods to calculate. The, the Raman spectra. I won't go into that, but, but in any event, it's, it's pretty much standard electronic structure theory. Nothing too strange. Uh, and uh, this is what you get. This is what, what's measured for BPE. Hey, you, you can tell it's the same molecule. But again, you've got these frames where something else is going on. So the question is, what's going on? And so uh, the the uh, so this is looking. Of course, the, there's an intense overall intensity loss, which could involve something like photothermal degradation. Although in the end, usually when you have that, then there's some background signal that's, that grows up that you don't see in this case. Uh, but but it could be something like damaging the hot spot, okay, with the, that 532, or it could be that somehow you're uh, you're driving some sort of surface diffusion process. Okay, we don't really know what the answer is on that. Okay, but uh, the but as far as fluctuations, and actually there's several things that could lead to fluctuations. The molecules could be moving around, okay, or they could be as conformational changes. So BPE is a cis and a trans isomer, and so it could be the cis isomer showing up sometimes. Uh, and then people have talked about these field gradient uh, mechanisms that uh, so far we don't think we've seen that, but some people think it's there. And, uh, the, uh, and then another possibility is charge transfer, that you're making the, the uh, radical negative ion of either the trans or the cis structure. Uh, 
Well, it turns out if you, if you so here we've calculated the, the, the uh, spectra of the radical anion. Radical anion is an open shell molecule and it shows resonance Raman uh, effects at the wavelengths that we're talking about. So, uh, so in the end, it turns out that one of the things that we had to do in my group was to, uh, was to uh, generate an open shell DFT code that could calculate resonant Raman spectra. So that was something we did recently. Uh, but anyways, what you see, that the, the, spe the differences between the radical anion and the neutral molecule molecule are enormous, okay, as maybe you would expect. Okay, so uh, so in the end, it, it, it should be easy to find the radical anion. And son of a gun, if you look into those spectra, it's easy to see it. Okay, so this is again uh, the uh, radical anion spectrum down here, and here it is. Okay, so the BPE peaks are over here to the right. This is the radical anion peak, very easily seen, okay, in various frames and in different particles and things like that. So, so even, even though, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say we've, we've identified every peak in every spectrum. We haven't, okay. But this one uh, is, looks really good, okay, and so therefore it suggests, indeed, we're getting the radical anion, but it doesn't last very long. It lasts for, you know, one frame and then it goes away, okay, and then you get, uh, you know, uh, you know, you get BP neutral back again. So, so it's a it's a spectrum. So I think we're going to hopefully build on this and start learning about you know the details of the of things like doing time resolve measurements. So what I'd like to do now uh, is to talk about something that's capable of doing time resolve measurements, which is uh, this femtosecond stimulated Raman scattering. I'm going to do the surface enhanced version of this. Okay, and so this is a relatively new technology uh, that we're bringing to bear on this, and uh, we're trying to understand it. So for, for this audience, I probably don't need to uh, say too much about what is femtosecond stimulated Raman scattering, but it's this four photon uh, process compared to the normal Raman process, okay, in which uh, there's, uh, well, it still comes out as a Stokes Raman signal, but it's stimulated, okay, and uh, so, so then uh, the, if you think about it, so the Rich Matthews group has pioneered this, uh, this technology, and uh, you know, it has both a frequency domain and a, and a, and a uh, time domain component to it, because there's, there's, a, there's two pulses of light that you're feeding into the system. One is a uh, picosecond, uh, you know, Raman pump, okay, and the other one is a femtosecond Raman probe pulse, okay. Uh, sometimes there's an actinic pulse that's put into this as well, but, but we're not doing that particular experiment. We're just simply trying to uh, see if we can understand the spectrum uh, where we just simply have the probe and the, and the, uh, and the uh, pump pulses, and the Raman spectrum appears uh, on the, uh, on the uh, you know, soak side uh, of, the, of the probe pulse, so it's a Raman common gain type of, of measurement that we're looking at. Okay, so uh, Van Dyne's group has already published papers in this area, actually quite a while ago, okay, uh, and this is what they got, okay, so uh, this is the BPE spectrum, okay, uh, that, uh, you know, is a Raman spectrum, pretty normal, as we were just talking about, uh, but this is what you get uh, for the stimulated, femtosecond stimulated Raman uh, uh, method, and you see the peaks are at sort of the same wavelength, but they're very asymmetrical, okay, and so it was like, what's this all about? Okay, uh, and uh, not only that, they found that if they used 90 nanometer particles that have plasmon resonances that are to the red of the, of the uh, probe pulse, then it uh, turns out you get this spectrum, but if you use uh, smaller particles, 60 nanometer particles, that are to the, where the resonance, the plasmon resonance is more right on to the resonance uh, or the position of the, of the probe pulse, then it turns out you get uh, the same lines, but they're now they're, the asymmetry is backwards. Okay, so it's like, oh, what's that all about? Okay, so anyway, so that problem has been sitting around for a few years now, and there haven't been any papers written on this topic, and so uh, it's like, okay, so we decided to see if we could make some progress. Uh, all right, so uh, the, uh, so, you know, these four-way mixing things, it's always like, oh, there's like solving the wave equation up here, okay, uh, where there's like an induced polarization that's driving the wave equation, and then, uh, then it coupled to that is uh, solving the equation for the driven oscillator, okay, where the pumping term, the driving term, involves the E squared term in the electromagnetic field, and in this case, since there's two fields, the pump and the, and the Stokes, okay, then when you take the square of that, you get cross terms, and 
one of them, this term right here, is the one that's in the fa in phase for driving the oscillator. Okay, and then uh, the other thing to realize is that this polarization uh, that goes up in here depends on this coordinate Q from this driven oscillator multiplied by, uh, in this case, it turns out the Raman pump field, and so that produces something that can then drive the Stokes probe uh, and uh, lead to enhanced uh, uh, Raman uh, signals. And so, uh, so anyway, so then you look into these equations. Okay, this is the same driven oscillator equation I was talking about a second ago, and it turns out the, the Stokes field uh, has a plasmon enhanced component to it uh, here, and in addition, there's a term in which the molecule gets excited, then that ex excitation is transferred to the particle and gets plasmon enhanced, and then it's transferred back to the, to the molecule. So the molecule sees itself. Okay, it turns out, this is a very important term, okay, and there's a similar one with the pump, okay, and it turns out that, that uh, the key to why that's important is that here I've got Q on the left-hand side of these equations, but I get both a Q and a Q star that appears on the right-hand side of the equation. So it's the Q star term that leads to dr dr a driven term which is out of phase, reverse phase actually, compared to the, the phase of the oscillator and so that's what can lead to uh, these uh, asymmetric lines and so here I'm just showing you where we calculate, in this case just the imaginary part of Q just to show that indeed uh, depending on whether we use 60 nanometer or 90 nanometer particles we can get these asymmetries and they're reversed with respect to each other and then we've also recently done, okay I didn't include that slide, the, the uh, the, actually converting that, the, the, in this case, the driven coordinate into a Raman gain, and, and you get results that are analogous to that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, the, the, uh, so I hope I've convinced you electromagnetic theory works well. And that's really nice. And then once you under, understand and believe all that, then you can start doing these experiments like these two-color experiments where you're looking at electron transfer processes, in this case at the nearly single molecule level. And, uh, and then in addition, we now have these time-resolved capabilities that come from uh, the physics measurement and I, at least we now think we understand what, what the line shapes mean. All right, thanks.